Welcome to Sales Velocity TV, where we pull back the curtain on how the top businesses in the world sell more with less resistance. Bringing over 50 plus years of combined sales experience and over 100 million in revenue generated, please welcome the hosts of Sales Velocity TV and two incredibly entertaining gentlemen, Andrew Cass and Aaron Parkinson. What is happening, my man? I'm home after a four-week family vacation, and I'm excited to be back. I on thought the it was show. three weeks. What do you mean four weeks? It was like three and a half. Felt like three years. I haven't. How you been, man? I haven't seen you in a year. Yeah, no, it feels like a year. That's the longest vacation I've ever taken. Yeah, you did the you did the United States tour. You being from Cayman, good to have you back. Got a great one today on accountability as it pertains to your sales team. But hey, listen, as it pertains to you too, if you're the salesperson. Right. So this is a really nice little system. And I'm going to build this episode today. I, I had the idea to talk about this, Aaron, in working with a private client who's been a private client of mine here in South Florida for many, many, many years. They have a you know, 10 million plus roofing company. Great guys. But they lost a little control of their sales team and their numbers tanked and nobody knew where anything was. And we sort of put the pieces of the Legos back together over the last month or so. And I thought this would be a really good case study, if you will, to share on Sales Velocity TV. So that's what we're going to talk about today. But before we do, um, I was asking you before the show began, are you a Star Wars fan? I am a Star Wars fan. Like big or just, oh, by the uh, way? I would say you... pretty big. I mean, I was, I was really big when I was a kid and... Um... I like what they're putting together now in the later episodes. I wasn't a, a like big the, fan like of Like the, the Star Wars stories, you mean, right? Yeah, like the you know the the new episodes that have come out in the theater over the last five years. I liked watching. Oh, oh yeah, the, the, the big you know Han the Solo big... get killed off, and like the, the it was it was the, the latest ones were intriguing. Yeah, the big the big three box office movies, but then they yep. do now. Disney now does the micro stories in between. They did the, the book of Boba Boba Fett. They did the Mandalorian. The reason I'm asking is because I just started the new Obi Wan Kenobi series. Are you familiar with this one? The, I haven't watched just any of those. In May, I have not watched any of those series. This well, this is one. This is the Obi Wan Kenobi. I forget what it's called. Obi Wan Kenobi something, right? And it's the yep. story. It's the backstory of Obi Wan Kenobi. And there's seven episodes, and I'm on. I'm on two right. I was waiting for my surround sound to be set up in my house before I I tackled it. It is awesome. And I knew you it would wanted, be awesome. You wanted the surround sound so you could hear that. Had to get it all in place first, man. Boom, boom. <laughs> <laughs> the the Vader breath, right? But yep. if you're a Star Wars fan watching and and you haven't seen the Obi Wan Kenobi, I'm only I'm only two in, but I'm it, it's so good. I just okay. you can tell the build up if you haven't seen it. Check it out. We did an episode a few months back on just the amazingness of that Top Gun movie as well. It seems like we've been, I guess, doing movie reviews lately. <laughs> So ah, why not, you right? Know, it's, it's current events and, and this is a this is a marketing and sales show and you know this I mean we're being sold these things, right? So it's it's interesting to talk about why they're compelling so that potentially you can leverage that into your own stuff. Yeah, that's a good point. We're being we're being sold experiences, right? And really a lot of what yeah. we talk about on the show is how do you amp up your experience because people will absolutely buy three, four, five, six fold an experience versus a product or a service. Yeah, I can't remember what George Lucas sold the Star Wars brand to Disney for. It was it was about ten years ago now. I, f I feel like it not was not even, just, not even. It was it was in the billions, wasn't it? Like oh five billion dollars or something. And it was such a shocking deal, right? It was like Disney's buying Star Wars. What a just an interesting deal. Very and, interesting. And thing. man, they you know Disney takes stuff and <laughs> if you if you watched the special effects of movies, Aaron. For, I don't know what it is with Disney. It's kind of like Apple with their retina display on iPhones. No matter what you do, you could put any other technology next to a retina display on an iPhone. You could put any type of animation next to a Disney animated movie, and it's not even the same ballpark. I don't know what they do, how they do it. Nothing looks fake. But then I'll go watch something from like, what are some of like the, 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 the competitors like Pixar or... Pixar, but they also own Pixar too, right? Yeah, they own that one now, so they cleaned it up. But whatever the other special effect movies are that aren't Disney, like it looks fake. Like the lions don't look real. The tigers look like they're like robots. Nothing looks as real as a Disney animation. And it's really awesome. Um, so I'm, I'm two in, but we're talking about accountability today. 
I'm holding you accountable to the Star Wars thing. That's really. You know, I, I will definitely go. Well, I'm, I'm in need of a new and it's, series. And listen, watching, it, I'm watching. It, it's quick, Aaron. It's seven episodes. It's not one of those like 16 episodes, two seasons. And you're like, ah, where do I begin? Yeah, I'm in. All right, I'm cool. Committed. So let's talk about accountability. Let's talk about your sales team. So here's what I noticed in working with this client. And this, I think, will be very instructive for you as a salesperson. But specifically, if you have a team of one or a team of 100, it doesn't make a difference. And what was happening is, and, and this was a, an outside sales team, three guys in the field covering from Orlando down to all the way down to, to the islands, actually. They're, they're, they're doing metal roofing out on your island, Aaron. That's like their main audience, wow. right? Yeah, so they have three guys in the field. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember this client. Yeah, he was talking about. You've I met, was talking you've, about you've met these guys. In Cayman Islands, and he said he could do that. You're right. You were you were at one of our meetings once. You've met them. Great guys. Um, great company. Super successful. Collectively, their two roofing companies probably do like ten to twelve million million dollars a year. And in this metal division, they have three sales guys. And there's a sales manager that oversees the three sales guys. And of course, the sales manager meets with the sales guys every week. They talk. They shoot the you know what. There's kind of on and off again training. But the owner who's my client sort of removed himself a little bit from that, which I have mixed feelings on. And I think you do as an owner of a company as well is how much involvement should the owner and CEO have with the sales team? I always think more than they think because I'm more of a sales oriented person. And I think that if you don't keep your eye on two things, the sales and the money, you start to lose control of the company, right? Yeah, I mean, the goal is to not have to, but unfortunately it can take you longer to get to that point than, than you want. Yeah. I, ultimately, you want to find your lieutenant. Yeah. Right? Ultimately, you want to find your lieutenant. And, and he has that, but he's not properly trained, which is where I came in. So I worked with these guys for two months and we did a couple things. Number one, you got to identify who. So there, here's the big one, the who, right? Who are they reporting to? Is that clear? Is it the sales manager? Is it you? Let's assume it's you as the business owner and the entrepreneur watching this right now. Your salespeople report to you or and this, will be, this will sound weird. You're the salesperson reporting to yourself. And you're right. like, what the heck does that mean? Well, you have to kind of hold yourself accountable here as well when it comes to selling. But let's assume you have a team of one or more, five or more, 10 or more, doesn't make a difference. Who are they reporting to? And then how frequently is that reporting happening? Is there a weekly meeting? Is there a bi-weekly meeting? And is it locked in stone where that meeting is happening? This is the most important starting point that we noticed was kind of happening. And then we started making it we started making it happen even more. And then we really got militant with it. And if you look at our company, Pipeline Pro, the software that powers our show, we meet with our sales team, me more than you, but you're there quite a bit. We meet with our sales team for 30 minutes twice a week, Mondays and Thursdays, like clockwork. And you know what? It's such a productive meeting. It's quick. Aaron, nobody can tell me they don't have an hour a week for their sales team. Nobody can tell me. Owner, CEO, partner, CFO, 30 minutes, getting in their head, making sure they're good. What do you need? What are you seeing? How can we improve as a company? How can we improve our assets to make you sell more? How can we help you make more money? This stuff is relationship building as much as it is accountability. And I think that gets lost early. Yeah. And I think it's a, a mindset thing. And I went through this when I was younger in my entrepreneurial journey is when I was younger in my journey, everybody worked for me, right? Do your job quit your whining, get the result, right? I don't care about your problems. And then as I, I grew in my experience and my wisdom, I realized I actually work for them, right? Tell me how it's going. What do you need? What resources can I provide? How can we improve, you know, our systems? Yeah, I, I want to see the reports and, and I'm going to hold you accountable to your numbers because that's important. But how do I serve you to make your job easier, because if your job's easier, I make more money. And I think you nailed it. If you don't look at your relationship with your sales team as a partnership, you've missed the boat on the relationship as well. You've missed the boat on the way it's supposed to go, right? So building quality relationships with your salespeople, having regular meetings with them, and it's not just business, personal too. What's going on in your personal life? I, have, I can't tell you, Aaron, how many times I've either worked with salespeople or worked with companies and their salespeople where their performance starts trailing off and we find out that it's something personal distracting them that we sure. didn't know about because we didn't ask or take the time to get to know them. And when we find that out and we even assist with that or become a sounding board for that or give them time off if they need it, you create better retention with your salespeople as well because you care. And I can't tell you how many sales 
sales organizations just rip through their people and don't really care because they want the numbers. But really, at the end of the day, of course, we want the numbers, but we also want the stability and the retention of the salespeople. Well, and that's why most people are surprised when they find out that some of the top salespeople in certain companies make more than the CEO, right? Because the, the person who can sell might be the most valuable person in your organization because they put the money in the till. And the challenge with being a salesperson, which most people don't recognize, is it is a day in, day out grind of the same thing over and over and over and over again. And if you don't build that relationship with your sales team and give them a mission to strive towards and pat them on the back and 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 bring them up when they're down and and give them new reasons to get excited consistently, you're, they're going to burn out. I mean, a salesperson that would work 20 years in the same company at a high level is almost impossible because you almost have to be insane to have that level of, you know, stability and consistency doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, right? So yes. you have to keep them propped up, you know, to keep them performing. It's a tough job. It's a tough job. And listen, you're a coach. This is no different. We, we use a lot of sports analogies. You are the coach. You are the offensive coordinator, however you want to look at it. And you're, you're the one that keeps morale up, right? You look at the best coaches in football, like a Bill Belichick. You look at some of these top coaches that are surfacing right now. This guy in, in LA, by the way, I love this guy. Um, drawn a blank. They just won the Super Bowl for the Rams. Um, such a good I am too. But he's a great coach. Uh, it'll come to me. Young guy. My God, he's like yep. late 30s. And he's just, it, it, they do a great job with motivation, morale, keeping confidence up, and making sure you like the environment, right? So that yep. who, in number one here, that who is important. Who is that person that is going to be responsible day in and day out, week in and week out, to show up and make sure that the team is met with and that the team is happy and that the team is being heard a big one that the team is being heard. One of the, one of the things I love to ask our team every week is, Hey guys, how are you doing? How are you feeling in the role? Is there anything you're seeing? Any trends we need to know about any place we can improve so that everybody can win. That's big. So that, that was kind of happening in my example. Okay. Number two is like the, what, what do they report? In this example, it was pretty much nothing. So, and, and, and I don't, you know, if you guys are listening, this is, this is to be constructive and obviously we're past the, the phase where you weren't really getting much from the salespeople. But if salespeople don't have a very specific thing to report to their employer company that they work for every single week in the form of what we call like a KPI report, a key performance indicator report, you don't have a sales team. You don't have a sales team. I told, I told these guys, I said, you have employees that are basically maintaining accounts, not selling and, and opening up new accounts and making new relationships because we don't know what they're doing. You got three guys in the field. They're basically just reporting in in a meeting. So they kind of had the, the meeting thing down, but there was no real, what are we reporting? So we created this spreadsheet and, and in this business, and it may be different in your business, they A, get paid on servicing existing accounts because people do repeat buying of metal products. So that's a different kind of a sales role where you're paid like residually. But in most organizations, you're paid on just acquiring new business. But if you're in a sales organization where you have the ability to acquire new and get paid and maintain existing and get paid on what they buy, that's a really nice two-headed income stream. And that's what they have. And that's exciting. And that's something that salespeople need to be reminded of because that's a really good environment when they can make money two ways. But here's what human nature does. Human nature defaults to what's comfortable. And all these guys were doing was calling up, guess who, Aaron? Existing the old accounts. Clients, the old clients. Existing accounts, path of least resistance. Can I come in and have lunch with you? Can I stop by? Do you want to come in? Just, just maintaining, schmoozing. I call it politics. I see you guys got a bunch of politicians, not salespeople. All they're doing is shaking hands and kissing babies. Which is good. Which is half of which the business, good. by the way. To maintain the relationship. To, it's great. Absolutely. And they're getting paid like a 1% on gross or something. So it makes sense for them to drum up repeat business and keep them happy. But here's what we found wasn't happening even at all, Aaron. No prospecting. Zero prospecting. It went away. Why did it go away? Because there was no reporting. What do I mean by reporting? Every single week now, they do two things. There's two columns. In this week, how many brand new relationships did we start? They don't have to buy. A hand needs to be shaken. A brochure needs to be handed out. A phone call needs to be made to a company that has never purchased from us before that is a candidate. 
They were not tracking that. They had no clue. So we, we set the benchmark. There should be three a week. Three brand new relationships started in a week. That's on the spreadsheet now. And the existing piece we'll get to in a minute, but that piece wasn't happening. So there was no drumming up of new business. So the co column now consists of how many new relationships did we start in this week? That's got to be reported every Tuesday for the previous week. And then in the second column is what they're already doing. How many existing clients did we reach out to and communicate with to drum up repeat business? Column two was happening. Column one didn't exist. Column one got implemented. All of a sudden, within two or three weeks, Aaron, they have twenty to thirty thousand dollars in new sales over the course of like twelve different accounts that have never bought from them before because the salespeople knew they were under the microscope. Yeah, and there's a subtlety here, right? Like if you look at our software, Pipeline Pro, it's it's set up. You can set up opportunity stages, right? So you can have somebody come in as a lead. Then they can become a warm prospect and then they can be a potential sale and then they can be a sale. And then you can, you can, you can create these opportunity stages and we have reporting that shows you at all times where everybody is in the journey and how much money is in the pipeline. And that's awesome. But the funny thing is, 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 is our previous sales manager that we had, we said to him, we would like the salespeople to fill out a report every day. Um, how many appointments were set, what was the show rate, um, what did they sell, what was the total revenue, what was the close rate. We want them to just fill in these couple of, of data points every single day. And he said, well, you have this great software that can just do it automated, so why don't you just look in the software, which <laughs> is a valid response, right? He's like, why? But he doesn't understand what we understand, which is when we've had automated reports getting spit out before and salespeople aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing or they're in a rut, they'll just hide for a while. And when you make them daily put their KPIs into your spreadsheet, then they have to actually look at their wins and they have to look at their losses. And there's nothing more painful than, than putting a zero in a spreadsheet and sending it in, right? right? It's, it's a lot easier when you have a zero and it's just in some automated report. When you have to physically enter zero. Goose egg, we used to call it. Goose egg. Goose egg. Right? Goose egg. I did nothing today. I suck today. I had no productivity today. That's not going to happen for very long because nobody wants to put a goose egg in their report every single day. 100%. So, yeah. 100%, man. Right? So it's the physical action. And this, this actually overlays into many things. I mean, even in, in my agency, we've got you know, account managers, for example, and I make them physically put in all of the stats of all of their clients once a week into a spreadsheet. And then we walk through it. I can pull that automated report myself. I want them to do it because I want you to see your wins. So you can be like, look what I did. Right. And I want you to show me your loss. I want you to feel the pain of putting the zeros on the spreadsheet, because then you're going to say, I need help or I need to do better, or I need more resources. You, you, nobody's going to put a zero in a spreadsheet for two weeks in a row. They're just not, and do nothing. I'm it's so not glad you happen. brought this up. It's funny you brought it up because where I was going next was, I said, how do you guys get that info now? Oh, it, we, they, we put, they put it, the salespeople put it in Salesforce. I said, that, it's your, your same analogy, Aaron. I said, that's great, but here's what I need them to do. Even though it's in Salesforce, I still need them to submit the spreadsheet to you every week and fill out the columns week by week and then once at the end of the month for the previous month. And here's one better, I said. Since you guys are a live brick and mortar business and your three salespeople are in-house, guess what I need you to do now? And they were like blown away by this. This is like old school now, right? Is I want it printed. I want them handing it in on your Tuesday meeting. Here's my columns. Here are the new prospects that I opened up. Here are the existing businesses that I tapped and did relationship building with. Here are my KPIs for the week. Yes, I know it's in Salesforce, but it's also on the spreadsheet and I'm also handing it in. And then we went one better, Aaron. Because it's a physical environment, each guy's spreadsheet's going up on the big screen in the meeting. Aaron Parkinson, um, let's take a look at your previous week. You opened up three new pieces of business. You tapped five existing clients, two of which bought, one of your three bought. You hit your KPIs this week. What do you think made you successful last week? I had them say. Start to dialogue. Person B comes up. To your point, goose eggs. Right in front of the team. 
not to be a dick, Social not to proof. put anybody down, but Mr. Smith, why do you think you fell short this week? What can we do to help you get these numbers up for you to hit your KPIs? Not put down, not embarrassment, accountability is and different they also get to from embarrassment to- and throwing someone under the bus. This is a business. We don't it's have kind of- time for liberal snowflake, everybody gets a trophy language. This is an ROI business. It is time for accountability, and only winners can handle accountability. Well, and when you get to hear what was the thing that helped the other people, then you get to have cooperation. And cooperation is really key when you have an organization, because there's no point in having a winner in a silo, right? What you want to have is a winner reaching down, whether they do it intentionally or unintentionally, to help bring others up. Because if you've got four winners instead of one winner, right, now it's a completely different business. And, And let's be clear, the accountability isn't there to shine, just shine a light on those that are failing. It's actually to also shine a light on those who are succeeding. That's right. One of the biggest challenges that we've seen in in business is that when you don't give somebody goals and you don't give them a mechanism to report what they've done and that they're winning or that they have challenges to address, then the problem is as the owner, you don't really know what they're doing. And so you're always second guessing their value of being part of your business. And as an employee, they're always wondering if you know how much they're doing and they don't feel recognized for their work because you're constantly like, what are you, what are you doing? What are you doing this week? What, what's happening? Right. They're like, you don't, you don't know what I'm doing. Everybody's everybody's in the dark on your example. Everybody's in the dark and everybody has lack of communication. So there's no help and there's no pat on the back when you're killing it. And and when people are killing it and they don't get recognition for killing it, they feel unappreciated and they leave. It's very discouraging and it shouldn't be. Right. Right? Which brings me to the final point, because you're an in-person business. So I came up in selling for anybody that read sales velocity. I came up pre-internet as a stockbroker in New York. You can't get into any more physical rough of a selling environment than that because we're required to make 200 dials a day, work day and night open up new prospects and new account. Like it's a real, real rat race, right? So the final piece of the puzzle was, guys, we need a bonus program now. Because now that you can see what they're doing, to your point again, Aaron, we want to see who's winning and who's losing. But guess what we're doing for new accounts, guys? They're like, what? $100 crisp cash bill on the table every single month for the previous month. This is a monthly thing, right? So any any brand new account that 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 cut a check in the previous month, like they had to, I mean, you, you could you could talk to ten people and have ten prospects, but the ones that transact were the ones we pay on. Guys getting four hundred crisp one hundred dollar bills at the meeting Tuesday in front of two people getting nothing. What's going to happen there, Aaron? I don't I don't I don't want to go with an empty wall at home. It isn't even about that. It's to your point again. Is now we're bonusing on prospecting. The company's profit margin is like 40, 50%. I'm like, guys, you, you're, and, and here's what they, it was, it was fun. I don't mean to say this in a demeaning way, but the, I said, guys, did, did you do the bonus program we talked about? Yeah, it's going to be in their paycheck uh, in the next two weeks. I'm like, guys, no, they're That's not getting not the taxed feeling. and they're not getting W2 on their bonus. This is only a hundred dollars for each new account. You guys are probably going to open three, four, five, six a month. I need you to go to the bank and I need you to pull out cash. And I don't just need you to pull out any kind of cash. I need $100 bills, but I don't just need any $100 bills. I need the new ones that are crisp and they look so plush and the paper is so rich and smooth and warm and fuzzy. Those are the ones I need. And I want them handed out like they're at a casino winning around at the blackjack table. And I need it done the first Tuesday of every month for the previous month. And I want the winners celebrated. And I don't want the guys that didn't get a bonus not celebrated. I just want them to see what they're missing. This was, Aaron, this was Nirvana. It's it, people don't understand. There's a different energy, right? And and I do the same thing with with my team in the agency, but slightly different. I like yours because it was physical. It's in my hand. It's got an energy resonating from it. It's different. Just putting it on the paycheck is just well. It's just more commissions. It's and, the same and it's going to get taxed because it falls into the W two. I'm like, you can't do that. I never thought about that, yeah. but it just doesn't have the same feel as look at me being recognized and it's put in my hand. It's different. 
when we give out bonuses, a lot of the time, um, I will say to them, I'm giving you this amount of money. You cannot put it in your bank account. You cannot save. You cannot pay off debt. You must go and buy yourself something that is completely frivolous that you would normally not get for yourself. And you must send me a picture of it. And if you don't, I will remove that amount from your next check. This and is, so I get people sending me the weirdest stuff like new barbecues or spa days or, you know, a new a new camping gear or whatever. And they talk about those things all year. Look at what I got. This thing that Aaron bought me, it has way more uh, value to it in their mind. It's just more on the paycheck, just has no energy to it. This is now, guys and gals listening, the psychology of accountability. There's accountability, right. and then there's the psychology of making accountability work. And this is, again, where most organizations fail because they're too they're too logical and they're not emotional enough here, right? So, yeah. you know, what's the saying that people make decisions? People, people the logic first emotion thing, I, it, I'm drawing a blank, is people... Well, there's a there's a there's an old saying, and part of this goes into what you're saying is that people will do more for recognition than they will for money. Right. There's that element. So there's that element, right? They get up, it's live, everybody's there. They get to show their wins. They get that recognition. That that is hugely powerful in a sales environment. That that recognition incentivization, right? That's a big part of what you're talking about. Yeah, it's something along the lines of people. Um, make decisions based on logic, but they buy based on emotion. I don't know if Correct. I'm saying it right. Something along those lines. But the point is what we're talking about here is not just doing the logical accountability things, but we're also talking about pulling emotional strings as well. And not in a manipulative way, in a recognition type accountability type way that keeps people happy, keeps relationships strong between you, the business owner and the sales team, and keeps people making money and keeps them there for the long term. It's brutal to have to go hire new salespeople. Oh, if you got so a good bad. guy or a good girl on your team, Make the best of who they are. Don't just wing it and show up half the time and maybe do accountability and do KPIs one week and not the other week and have a sales meeting one week, but then cancel it the next week. You just create turnover. And that's what we're trying to avoid here with this little and process. Here's, and here's a, an extra element to what you just said there, which is really important. Right now, salespeople are at a premium. If you are in an industry, let's just choose this one, roofing. And you got a salesperson that's bringing a million dollars a year in business to you. And you're not paying attention. You're not creating stability. You're not rewarding that person. You're not patting them on the back. Your competitor will happily swoop in at any time and say, they don't appreciate you. You know what? I'm going to bump you 10%. I'm going to put you in this bonus pool. I'll slide you right in. We got this, 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 this. And they're gone, man. They're gone. Here's the other side of that. If you've done all we said and you've taken the time to work with the person, not just the salesperson, but the two combined, the human as well as the salesperson, and you've forged enough of a relationship and you care enough to meet and have KPI reports and do bonuses and find out what's working, what's not working, they feel bad taking that offer. They feel bad. They feel guilty. Loyalty that, like, there's a certain amount of loyalty that gets established right. in connection with you as a human. That's but right. One of the biggest fears that salespeople have when they're looking at a transition is how organized is this next place I'm going to go to going to be? Because in order to make money, it needs to be organized, right? I need to be, I need to have, you know, my assets to work with. I need to have my meetings. I need to have my KPI docs. I need to know that I'm going to get paid on time, that there's mm -hmm. going to be bonuses. The, the thing that, that salespeople hate the most is instability. Humans hate instability, whether you're a salesperson going into a commission role or a new employee who makes an executive salary going into a new company. We all don't want to do the start and stop and start and stop. It goes it goes to both sides. Here's the yep. third piece, Aaron. The third piece is how is the training conducted? So I did really like a simple who, what, how here. Who are they reporting to? What do, the re what do they report? And then how is the training conducted? And training is important because if you don't have ongoing training, if you don't analyze, if you don't maybe listen to some calls, if you don't offer suggestions, you know, I come from the, as I mentioned before, the, the background of at eight o'clock every single morning, we would have a sales meeting and there'd be 60 to 70 guys in the sales meeting and you could get called on without even knowing you were going to get called on and you had to pitch the whole room. So this was almost like a public speaking thing at one point, right? You had to pitch the whole room 
whatever that stock or mutual fund or whatever we were pitching at the time. And, and you'd, you'd just have to perform, right? You'd have to practice the script, right? You'd have to practice the language, the pausing, right? The communication. So that's pretty tricky to do. And training needs to be very consistent. It needs to be very consistent, the training. And these guys were doing the meeting, but there wasn't a whole lot of training happening. But now the training is 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 almost a byproduct of what they report because you can't really train on anything if you don't know what's going on with the numbers and how they're actually performing. It gives you content. So like if I find out, Aaron, if you're my sales guy, Aaron, right? And I find out three things that you uncovered in the field last week and you tell me what those are, that gives me training content because I might have identified something that is like a hole somewhere, right? I was listening to... I was listening to somebody's sales pitch recently and, and something important that I noticed that I think would be important for this, this here is the client was done. I was actually on because I was helping with the sale. The client said, all right, let us think this whole thing over. Everything sounds great. That whole, that's a normal spiel, right? And the salesperson said, okay, what would you like to do next? Would you like to hold your thought, Aaron? Just hold your thought. I see you nodding. What if you're if you're watching? He's nodding a lot. What what would you like to do next? Should I call you next week? Do you want to call me next week? And it went like that. And when I got off, I see you did a great job, but you almost looked desperate at the end when you were sort of you almost looked like a deer in headlights. What 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 do you want to do next? The shift would have been from a training standpoint and a languaging and a positioning standpoint would have been. Okay, great. Here's what I'd like to suggest as next steps. I'm going to call you Monday at 4 p.m. Is that enough time for you and your partner to go over the information? Yeah, it sounds great. Awesome. In the meantime, I'm also going to send you a PDF overview of what we talked about. If you have any questions, write them down. Four o'clock on Monday, does that work for you? Yes, great, good. I'll get those questions answered. And at that point, uh, hopefully we can figure out if this is a path for you. If it is, awesome. If it isn't, that's fine too. But let's make sure we get everything out on the table on our next session. How does that sound, Aaron? Yeah, you can't leave an open loop at the end of the sales call, right? Crazy, you were dying to get out there. You had to mute yourself. It was so weird, right? I, I just, <laughs> what do you want to do next? I, I, what I want to do is I want to shoot myself next. Thanks for asking. Yeah, right? it was really, it's, just, it, it's like it everything so went weird. well and then it's just sort of like the sizzle came out of the balloon. So, yeah, I mean, at the end of a call like that, my first thing I'm going to ask someone is, okay, based on everything we covered, does this sound like what you were looking for? Uh, yes. Okay, great. Here's our next steps. One, two, three, four. No. Okay. Is there anything in particular that made it not what you were looking for? Well, I was really hoping for something that, well, if we could add that in, would we now have checked all the boxes for what you're looking for? Yes, I would have. Okay, great. Here's the next steps. No, you still wouldn't have. And then you start to question, are they the right fit for what you have? Because maybe they're going to be a pain in the ass client and you don't want them, right? So now you have to make that judgment call. But there's no open loops ever. 100%. Are you, are you, are, are you available for a position? That was just great. That was great. No, listen, we've been doing this a long time. I think in the beginning of the show, collectively, when we look at our actual in the trenches, real world selling experience, I mean, I was selling at 19, 20, Aaron. I think you're probably about the same. I just turned 49. You just turned 45, I believe. So um, that's a lot. That that's that's about five decades combined, if I do my math correctly, of actual conversations being had. And by the way, we still have them, right? There's plenty of instances where you and five I will have big conversations. Me. We're not doing prospecting and sales calls on a daily basis, but we will come into a lot of deals and we will negotiate, talk, communicate, help, assist, move deals along. Or present something for someone or present something directly if we were needed. It's I jokingly say, you know, we kind of kind of are like the Luke Skywalker of our, to, to my Star Wars analogy from the beginning of the show, how fitting was that, right? I, I sometimes jokingly with my sales team say, listen, anytime you need to bring Luke Skywalker in to, you know, use the force and maybe move things along, happy to do it. Because I don't say it to be arrogant, but that's a lot of decades of experience in which a lot of it comes second nature. You heard those off the cuff scripts we just did right here. I mean... Go listen to this again and pull those. Those are those are those are articulate, authority-driven phrases that just basically make somebody feel a little bit more confident with you. Those are leadership-type questions, not 
wishy-washy, I don't know where to go type questions, which subconsciously for the prospect makes them feel like, is he new? Yeah. Newbie? He must be if he's new. Not confident, if he's not confident in the sales call, why? It's because he's not confident in the product. He's yeah. not confident in the service. Yeah. What's the... What's the problem? Yeah, right? all, so. all, all of all of that. That's why, that's why all of this matters, right? So looping back to the topic of the day, we can get into the psychology of sales scripts and positioning and talking and asking questions and all that. We've done it in many episodes. You can go shoot back to salesvelocitytv.com and pull many. But really for today, in recap here, who do they report to? Got to have your lieutenant. And it doesn't matter if it's you. Frankly, it should be you until you really feel like you got someone good. What do they report? Again, the specificity of what are they reporting? There has to be benchmarks coming in every single week or you have no idea what they're up to, especially today, Aaron, when a lot of people are remote. It Absolutely. matters more today than ever because people are remote. And the example of, of today's company, they happen to be a physical brick and mortar business in Miami. Great. That's better because they have a little more control. You lose control with the whole Zoom virtual lifestyle. And, and, and the third piece don't get away from is the training piece. And if it's not you, bring someone in to train or to oversee training. But there has to be that element of consistent daily, not daily as much, but weekly, monthly training to keep them sharp, but also to fact find and to learn. Training is as much for them as it is for you, because when you train, you learn how you can shift things to be better. We were doing, I was doing a call yesterday, Aaron, with, with our, our Pipeline Pro sales team. Great guys. Um, I get into their head every week. Guys, what's going on? What are you seeing? What can we do to make your role even better and for you to have fun and make more money? I, I pretty much say it like a broken record. And you know what we did is we implemented a brand new follow-up campaign yesterday that gave us a couple more touches to increase show-up ratios. Guy said, this is what we'd like to see. I said, let me put my chief guy on it. Went in, adjusted some things around, tweaked a few of our follow-up calls to get people to show up more couple little tweaks. And I said at the exact words at the end of the, the, the call, I said, you know, guys, this stuff is great for me too, because these are like little hinges that swing big doors every time we, we, we talk. And if we get one little hinge once a week, twice a week, and we look at the end of the month, we might have implemented five or six little things that equal a big end result. It's like Bill Belichick always, always says, I'm looking at his book here, by the way, Belichick and Brady, right? The book, he always says, you know, you, you know, the, the methodology, Aaron, just do your job, right? It's always just do your job. Stay in your lane. Do your job. But he always says, when he gets the question, mainly when they were winning Super Bowls a lot, how do you keep winning over and over and over again? And he would always say, it's not really any big secret. We just do a lot of little things right. We don't do anything really big. It isn't just the quarterback like people think, right? It's little things done consistently, day in and day out, little hinges swing big doors, and what that does is it compounds and collectively it equals big results, which for them was seven Super Bowls in 15 years to that example. Absolutely. And I, I would add one more last thing and then we'll wrap up the show today is oftentimes people overlook the ongoing training thing because they think maybe the people that they're training don't want it like it's a job. But there's a lot of people in organizations that are looking to continue to grow in life. And when you provide them the opportunity to grow, whether that be through ongoing training or advancement or promotion or learning a new skill, whatever, they feel like they're making progress. And, you know, Tony Robbins said that, that the number one thing that humans need in the world is progress. Right. So that's another element that allows people to feel like they're growing, which allows people to stay longer, which allows more consistency for you. They're happier. You're happier. So on and so forth. So don't overlook that thinking like it's some big obligation that the team's not going to want. Yeah, 100 percent. It's such an important role. But again, it's 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 three legs of a stool here. Right. It's it's all of the three that I mentioned. I tend to like to box things into threes if you've been watching the show for a little while. But you have to you can't do one and then not the other. I always look at it like it's three legs of a stool. If you're you know, if one leg's missing, the stool starts to tip. If two legs are missing, the stool doesn't stand a chance. And you're only as strong as your weakest link with things like this. So you got to have the, the lieutenant. You got to have the reporting and you got to have the training. And those are my big three. And that goes for you as well. I know we have a lot of independent solo entrepreneur, solo sales professionals here as well, you can find a way to put accountability systems in place for yourself as well. And it's the same thing. 
Do you have benchmarks that you hit for yourself every week? I mean, there's no better use of time than making sure you're performing in the role of being the CEO of you Inc. as well. Don't think for a minute that this only transfers to someone else and not yourself, right? Oh, Training. I can't, Andrew, I can't tell you how many clients that we work with that are in that solo space that don't know their numbers. They, they don't know and their I numbers. say to them, like, how, well, how many leads do we generate this week? How many people we talk to? How many people we close? What's our conversion rate? What's our revenue? No idea. So the funny one is, who do you report to? They're like, well, me? Yeah, you. You report to you. You, you look and, at yourself and, and as you. if... And you would be fired today by you the, the for your lack of is, Would you fire you if you had to report to you and you really held yourself accountable? And so another like one of those really like weird counterintuitive questions. What does that even mean, Andrew? You know, would I fire me? Yeah. Think about it. If you're the salesperson, are you performing? Are you reporting into yourself? Do you have KPIs that you deliver to yourself every single week? And do you take, there's no shortage of training today. In fact, this was a training for 45 minutes here today that you could listen to over and over again. I mean, Aaron, you know that, that, you know, I'm a big health and fitness guy and I know you are as well. We talk quite a lot about this stuff, but when I started tracking, I got away from it for a while, the actual tracking of my, what am I doing for workouts, sets, reps, weight. And when I started with the X3 system, which is the variable band system that we've talked about now going on two years, um, because the app came with the program, and you tracked your progress to your word earlier. We talk a lot about this on the show, right? Progress. Tony Robbins coined that as, you know, we're more driven by the act of making progress than the money or the accolades, right? But when you see that progress and you check in with yourself, it starts to become contagious and it starts to become fun. And it's the same thing in sales. As soon as you stop tracking, you stop seeing. As soon as you stop seeing, that isn't a great destination that you're headed to. Right, so visibility is everything. Tracking, reporting carries over to all walks of life, right? Carries over to fitness, like we talked about. It's sales, it's business, it's accounting. Heck, it's relationships, right? It's personal Absolutely. development. I started keeping a journal, Aaron, over here somewhere um, when I got to my new house. Sometimes new environments cause you to do new things. I find, right? So I started keeping a journal on. I'm trying to like meditate in the morning, right? like just getting my, my breath work and my head right first thing in the morning before anybody's awake. It's usually dark or the sun's just coming up. But I don't just do things anymore just to do them because I know if I just do it to do it and I don't track it, then I'm going to get away from it. So like I hold myself accountable. And when I do like my journal at night, like of the things that I'm tracking, it tends to be like a personal development, health and wellness type journal where I'm tracking my supplements, my workout. Meditation now makes that reading is part of all that, like the growth of me, Right. So now I'm putting in, did I do my box breathing, five to 10 minute gratitude meditation today? And then I go back in the week. This is no different than sales KPIs, by the way. Then I go back in the week and I go, ah, oh, cool. I got it four days, but I missed one. And I know why, because maybe, yeah, but, but I see the numbers. And I'm like, I'm sticking to it because the act of writing it and tracking it makes me sort of feel guilty if I don't do it because I've already held myself accountable. And this is You don't me. want to put a goose egg in. I don't want to put a goose egg, but I know it's also okay if I do because you just get right back on that wagon the next day. But if you don't track it, and again, this applies to everything. If you don't track it, eventually you will get away from it. And that's the whole premise here is these are things that you can never get away from because if you do, you got salespeople running on their own agenda. And by the way, in my example today, the three guys, one of them is about to be fired. Not by me, by the way, but because he can't, he can't produce anything. The second guy struggling, Aaron, the first guy's killing it, loves the accountability because that's his personality. He's a pro, right? So of the three guys, you have three totally different scenarios. I wasn't expecting it to be the, the, the only three scenarios you can have are the three scenarios that we have. One guy's pretty much out because he can't do it. One guy's killing it because he loves it. There's a guy in the middle struggling, going back and forth. Those are the only three scenarios. And interestingly, we're dealing with Okay, guys, we, we have two months of results and we have three guys in three different places, but now we know. And now we might not keep someone on board because we're nice guys. We don't pay salaries, I told. These guys are getting salaries, Aaron. They're making like 50 grand a year base and then commission. I'm like, guys, we don't pay salary. I say we speaking on their behalf. We don't pay salaries for guys to be politicians and make phone calls to existing business. That's, that's, that's not what we do, right? We pay salaries to guys who can bring in new business and they drum up repeat business. But if they're not gonna, if they're not gonna do any of that, then they're, you can give them the choice. Since you're not able to open up new business, we are happy to put you on a commission only schedule. You watch how much they perk up when they hear that maybe they're gonna go to commission only. So you gotta be careful too of the money. 
You got salespeople on salary. Don't let them take advantage of that scenario. They can get real comfortable on a salary. That's why you got to be, the salary thing is a balancing act. It shouldn't be too high where they get comfortable, but it shouldn't be too low either. I mean, for me, it's non-existent. I don't really deal with salespeople on salary. So to me, it would be out. I don't know what your thought is. I just think that the bigger point here is that how long has this company been carrying one, if not two people who can't do the job? And that doesn't mean that they're bad people. Maybe they'd be a better fit for a different role in the organization because they've got different skill sets or other, or maybe they're distracted by something else, or maybe they're working two jobs. I mean, there's so many elements that could be impacting those results, but if you can't see it, mm -hmm then you are th basically burning your money on nothing. Yeah, that's exactly right? what was and happening. Now at least they can see it and then they can go, okay, what's, what's the best decision here? Maybe the guy in the middle, he needs to be coached up a bit right. so he can get to the top. If he doesn't respond well to that, okay, then he needs to be let go. Probably the guy in the bottom just needs to be let go. Now we're going to go and find, look for somebody who has the same personality traits as that top person because they're knocking it out of the, out of the you know, out of the park. Yep, yep, that's exactly. And all it. of a sudden, maybe we're, we end up doubling or tripling sales with you know, just having eyes on it. That's exactly it. You just nailed it. So you find out a lot about who you've got on your team when accountability systems go in place. So hopefully this was helpful. This is one of those Aaron that is worth a second listen. I know a lot of you are watching on SalesVelocityTV.com where all our past episodes are. But if you're listening on the go. I always say, listen, if, you're, if there's a lot of content coming at you and it seems overwhelming, listen to it once without any agenda. Just listen, take it in, listen, take it in. Go back and listen with notepad and pen in hand. Get some ideas of the scripting we talked about. Get some ideas of the language we talked about. But make sure you box you or your people into an accountability system or it's not a pretty destination if you don't. I'm going to leave it there, buddy. Go watch Obi-Wan Kenobi. I'm on it. Um, let me know how you do. Episode number two at the end. I couldn't sleep last night. That's all I'm going to say. Goosebumps at the end. I'm on, I'm on, to, I'm on to number three tonight. Um, if you're a sales pro watching, I'm going to go back and listen to any past episodes. We're at salesvelocitytv.com. All video and audio, all your favorite podcast platforms. You can download it wherever you prefer to listen. And we are live every single Friday at 11 a.m. Eastern in the public Sales Velocity TV Facebook group. Everybody have a great one. That's Aaron. I'm Andrew. We'll see you next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Sales Velocity TV is powered by Pipeline Pro, the ultimate all-in-one sales pipeline management and marketing automation platform that makes all others obsolete. And we can prove it. Take a tour at gopipelinepro.com. See you on the next episode.